Yes. All right. So, um, so at Tech Impact, if you've not heard of Tech P Impact, uh, we're a nonprofit serving nonprofits in the tech space, and our mission um, is to leverage technology to advance social impact. Um, this year, we're celebrating 20 years of working with the nonprofit sector, um, and you know, excited to celebrate that milestone. Um, you know. Our services, we've been a longtime partner of TechSoup. Um, we do nonprofit tech services, so we provide impartial advice. Um, we do managed IT support services for nonprofits. We have about 350 nonprofit managed service support clients. Uh, we also have a whole education arm, so we do a lot of unbiased research. Um, we make it easy to understand. Um, and then we have a workforce development program. Um, so with that, we, you know, help provide young individuals um, the IT skills they need to get formidable careers. Um, I've been with Tech Impact a little bit over four years. Um, started out as actually a customer of Tech Impact for some project-based work. So have a long long-term knowledge of the organization. Prior to joining um, Tech Impact, I served an organization probably in the same needs that you serve your organization. I came on staff, I was young and was pretty much handed the management of our IT along with marketing, event management, um, you know, and, and everything else, data management, um, and kind of became the go-to for all those resources within the organization. Spent 20 years there. Um, I am what you call an accidental techie. I came in, I was tech savvy and really had to get up to speed to serve our organization well. Um, moved to Tech Impact about four years ago and really my breadth of knowledge has expanded since sitting in Tech Impact and, um, and just really, um, getting that expertise and the support from team members and knowledge um, to help continue our, you know, serving our clients. Um, my current role at Tech Impact is I oversee all of our account management. So ensuring that we're giving our customers the, the service that we need to. And if you're an accidental techie, I, I did not like that term, accidental, accidental techie, but um, I would say I'm really no longer an accidental tech. I, I grew up and I think anybody who calls himself an accidental techie, I think um, is exciting because we all become professionals at some point. Um, so I'm going to let George introduce himself. He is um, my counterpart here at Tech Impact. Hi, I'm George Dayton. I've been working for Tech Impact about three and a half years, just a little bit after Melanie. Um, I'm a little bit different. I came in here from corporate America. I have about 30 some odd years within corporate America and infrastructure. Um, and now I'm managing the cybersecurity practice for uh, Tech Impact. And I try to bring my knowledge uh, and my skills from that 30 years into the, uh, the nonprofit space and find solutions. Um, that will fit um, are always challenging financial needs um, and abilities within the within the nonprofit space. But we're able to leverage um, the 350 clients we support to bring you know very in depth solutions to our customers and also others that come to us that may not necessarily be a managed service. Here to help. All right. Thank you. Nothing else, George. You got nothing else? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, so where to start with managing devices? Um, I was extremely fortunate, I guess, um, because when I was servicing my organization, we were all in the office. We were, everyone was there. Um, I, you know, moved to Tech Impact probably three months prior to the COVID um, situation. Scenario. So I always like to say the, the rest of the world went remote with me. Um, but, you know, handling our technology, our organization, I was help desk 
for all of our staff and it made my job uh, a lot easier. Um, I knew where my devices were, everyone would come into the office and I think life was much more simpler at that time. Um, so when it comes to multiple devices, employees everywhere, um, you know, I think what you need to focus on and um, is just simplifying your IT infrastructure. When I first joined Tech Impact, I would receive, um, I would be on probably 15, 20 meetings a week with nonprofits, just learning about their environments and helping guide them in their decision making. And one thing that um, I think nonprofits fail at is just number one, consolidating devices, but also standardizing devices. Um, if you're going to purchase workstations, ensure that you are, you know, staying with similar make models, builds. Um, using something like through TechSoup, you can get some discounted hardware through Dell, Lenovo, or whatever. If you're going to choose Dell, you know, stay with Dell. Um, if you're going to do Lenovo, it's just going to make it easier for you to manage your warranties um, and just have a list of devices that you've purchased and, and be able to manage them. And plus, it's going to be easier for you to support those. Consolidation is something that um, I think nonprofits need to focus on now. When the COVID pandemic hit, um, there were a lot of employees that did not want to give up their desktop. Um, so nonprofits bought laptops in volume and we're still finding that a lot of organizations have the dual desktop laptop. I would say invest in a good docking station and really truly port that laptop around like it's intended to do. Um, you want to minimize applications and admin access. Uh, we've seen an uh, incredible amount of organizations that there's so many cloud option, options, app options, um, that you really want to keep that under control. Something to help you is maybe setting up policies and procedures in terms of controlling that, but in terms of managing devices, your your um, and everything within the organization, you will wanna minimize them. And then if you still have servers, if you still have a infrastructure sitting somewhere in the office, I would definitely consider moving um, to, the, to the cloud. So I think the most important part of it, and George, anything to add to that previous slide? Yes, please. Like, so when Melanie said, keep your machines similar, so same manufacturers, um, it really helps two a few different ways. One is the support, you get used to supporting that, that brand of manufacturer. You get used to engaging with the warranties, understand how to keep those up to date. Um, and also will help you on your security footprint because you're only managing one type of device, not multiple. And those devices will be similar in the way you manage your security access. Um, minimizing applications and administration, administrative access to these machines also comes into play from a security perspective. If you're going for cybersecurity insurance, they're going to ask you how many applications you have, who has access to them, who are the administrators. You want to leave that to a minimum. Um, so that you don't allow holes out there for bad actors to uh, to use to gain to gain access into your information. No matter how big or small you are, they're going to come after you. I can tell you, we deal with multiple breaches a week. So um, limit access, limit your applications, stay consistent in your uh, in your infrastructure, the, the devices you use. Um, also, moving to the cloud, um, it will help you in your disaster recovery and business continuity plans. We at Tech Impact helped a lot of people during COVID get to the cloud, and it made it easier for their, their uh, employees to access what they needed to because now they can access it from wherever, not necessarily just in the office. Great points, George. I think you said it even better than I did. Um, but I want to point out that this. Um, this webinar is about device management. Overall, cybersecurity, like we're gonna mention security a lot. And in terms of security, you know, it, it touches every point 
of an organization. We are going to be doing a third session, which I'm sure TechSoup will share just around cybersecurity alone. So device management, someone has it in. How do you, how do you manage all the inventory, the parts, the switches and all of that? Um, so, you know, like I said, 57% of staff work hybrid or fully remote. Um, so this is a study done recently in uh, June, 2023 um, by the National Council of Nonprofits. They partner with Idealist, 57%. And, you know, just in speaking to nonprofits, that number is gonna grow. So where are your devices? You know, do you know how old they are? Um, does it have a virus or malware? When was the last time it was scanned? Um, you know, do you have controls on what's been downloaded on them? Are they safe? Um, are they being patched? I think this is something that it was, um, it was really difficult for me to tell my staff, reboot, you need to reboot, you need to do your patches. George, you wanna share why patches are so important? So, um... Security patches are your first line of defense against uh, bad actors, viruses, malware, um, that type of thing. There's always um, someone out there trying to break into your machine. Microsoft and Apple, they do a lot of work. They have a lot of engineers out there watching for it and closing those holes. So you need to keep up with, A, your operating system patches. And from a small organization, you can turn that on automatically and Microsoft or you know, Apple will, will update them. But you also need a good virus protection piece of software and malware protection, protection software. They could be one and the same, sometimes they're not. Um, and make sure that you keep them up to date. Um, from a small, uh, you know, small organization or large organization, make sure you're scanning a machine at least once a week um, from, from virus protection and watching what the outcomes are of that. Again, if something doesn't feel right, it normally isn't. So if the machine's not behaving well, it's slow, the you know, mouse is moving around, video's flaky, always run virus protection first and then update your patches um, to whatever operating system is. Um, application downloads um, are always interesting um, and uh, can be challenging. Uh, first of all, make sure you're downloading applications from a known site. Um, be careful of links that you get from Instagram, Facebook, or any of these social media sites. Um, they can um, really hide your, where you're going to. You're at your absolute destination. Um, if you've noticed a lot in phishing, well, we'll, we'll, I guess we can move on. I won't get that far into it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can go down a rabbit hole with, with any of these. Um, so overall advice is to implement a device manager. Um, it's, it's about automating these tasks. Um, so what is a device manager? It basically is a tool set to manage devices, you know, it gives you the ability to deploy, keep those, you know, update patches, configure settings, and enforcing the policies and then also monitoring. Um, it gives you the ability to administer a virtual machine. Wherever your staff is, um, you can administer it. Um, maintain a network devices, common operating systems, you know, Windows, Mac, iOS, Linux, and Android. I think you will, you know, have to find some device managers are, are Mac only, Windows only. Again, it goes back to standardizing your environment. Um, and then you want to pre, you know, it just gives you a single point of management for devices. Um, and, you know, it's all managed from a console. And then it protects your data on devices and that. And we're not going to go into it, but there's device management and then there's mobile application management that will be covered in the third, third webinar. Um, but just the differences right now, we're just talking about device updates and management. Um, George, you want to add anything there? Um, it can be complicated. Um, make sure you read about it or find some professional help, but it, it will make 
after the, the initial installation the complexity part of it, it will make your life a lot easier moving forward as you bring systems in and out of your environment because you're managing from the central uh, central point. So when I think of device managers, I definitely don't think of Microsoft and Google, but they do have device management. Um, I would, you know, when you talk about Microsoft, you're talking about Microsoft Intune, and that is the device manager on Microsoft. You in in Google Workspace, they just call it endpoint management. Um, little, there's, I think they're still sorting some things out, but they've really evolved lately in um, being able to manage the endpoints. With Microsoft and Google, it's really important that if you want to use this tool set, that you have the right licensing is the first consideration and you understand your licensing costs. Microsoft Intune um, is included in, if you're a smaller organization, up to 300, it is included in the Microsoft Premium you know, business premium licenses, which most nonprofits are using at this point. Um, the first 10 of those licenses are free. Each additional license after that is $5.50. Um, if you, you know, it's included in other various licensing, but you have to ensure that you get the licensing right. Google keeps fluctuating. Um, they have basically a fund fundamental device management in their lower tier, the free for nonprofits and the uh, the next level up. But really to get the full endpoint management, you have to go to their highest level, which the last time I checked was $6 uh, per user per month. But one thing also I want to point about Google, if you have a bunch of volunteers in your environment, Google, you cannot mix and match licensing like you do on Microsoft. So definitely research the licensing costs, understand what, what that implicates. Another thing is, is Microsoft is always changing. I said Google is changing its environment. These setting up Microsoft and Google for device management really takes some expertise or someone who's really going to dedicate the time to learning these systems and then having to relearn them in, in two to three months. Um, but it takes a, a, a special set of expertise. Um, great benefit is, is if you're already in these environments for everything else, it makes sense. Um, George, anything to add to that? So I saw something come across the chat with Apple Business Manager. Yes, they're very good for the um, iOS and, and you know, uh, Apple products. Um, they also are very good at integrated into Microsoft Intune and also Google. So, um, yeah, so if you have iOS devices, either one of these will, will support it and communicate with Apple Business Manager. I just saw that in the chat, so I bring it up. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I will agree with Melanie, is, is if you are, going to deploy this, please take time, either have someone help you or take time to learn it. Um, because if you click a radio button on the wrong way, it will be bad. <laughs> and and you, you, you can lock people out. But it will also secure your, your environment and help you with managing them on a day-to-day -day basis. So do suggest it. Um, and, you know, really would ask you to investigate it and see how it could fit in your environment. There are, you know, those those are the ones, and that's usually where we we steer our clients because we have the extra expertise to configure it, um, and and you know, and kind of do it uniformly throughout our clients. Um, there are other device management platforms. I'm not vetting these. Um, I'm not saying I recommend these, but these are other ones that I heard nonprofits use. Um, there, you know, um, there's Genuity. Um, don't know how they do it, but it is $29.99 a month for an entire organization for device management. Again, you're going to have to look at your needs, vet these systems yourself, and see if they will meet it. Um, SpiceWorks is is another option i'm sorry i don't know the pricing but it's pretty affordable and then if you are um a mac 
shop and you have a lot of Apple devices, Jamf is pretty much the most common one that I hear um, in terms of device managers. Hold on, I gotta get back to the screen. Um, if anyone has any device managers they're currently using, uh, definitely feel free to put it in the chat to share with others. Um, I know uh, one organization for their asset management used a tool, a tool called Asset Tiger that was free, that was, um, you know, very good for them. So they were a large organization and it would allow individuals to sign in and sign out equipment. Um, so do we wanna tackle some of the questions? Um, just a, a nice opportunity to take a break and get some of the questions. Um, yeah, um, there was a question from Sheridan. What exactly should a device manager do? Good question. Um, you, know, you, you look at, you know, one is asset management is to say what, you know, what is that device? You know, is, is, it, a, is it a laptop, desktop? Is it a mobile phone? Um, what's running on it? What applications are there? It would also should help in managing, uh, putting patches or security updates on those devices. And, you know, it help you onboard a, a new employee. So you get a new device, make it easier to onboard that. Also offboard that device, or if that device is now compromised, you know, as we know uh, with phones and laptops, we, you are human, we tend to leave them somewhere. So how can we secure that device if it's not in someone's hands? So they're just the things that just more, really looking, understanding what that device is. Um, there's all sorts of bells and whistles. Uh, but I always say, be careful, bells and whistles, because, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a shiny penny. So decide what you want, what you need when you're going through that, what makes sense for your organization, and deploy the tool that would work. Um, I guess that's the best I can say, you know, without getting real deep into it. Awesome. I'm going to go to the Q&A to answer, to ask some questions. But before I do, there was a question earlier from Shelly. She said, we've moved mostly to the cloud as we're mostly remote now. We're a small think tank organization and we need a few things. Number one, how and where to dispose of our old tech. And number two, how to find a reliable IT company that can redo all of the ancient wiring to help dismantle a server room that is no longer necessary? Um, I can help this. In every area, there is a refurbisher that would be willing to take your old equipment and refurbish it. Uh, Google's your friend here uh, to find a refurbisher. That's usually what we do for our clients. Um, sometimes when they're in an area and we know a refurbisher, we'll, we'll kind of schedule them in a group pickup to get rid of that um, equipment. In terms of cabling and cleaning out a, 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 you know old stuff, I, I would say local is probably your best bet. We do have a provider that we work with um, that we, we have go on site and, and do cable work. Um, so if you need us, you're always free to reach out to us. But usually I would just search locally for someone to do that. When I can add, when refurbishing or when you're disposing of your old devices, if you're having a company do it, make sure that they're wiping your hard drive. And the, the buzzword of the day is DOD wipe it, Department of Defense wipe it. Um, it's a technology, it's a term that they would understand, but you want, you don't want your data, no matter how benign you think it is, going to another person. Awesome. So now I'm going to go to the Q&A. DJ said, our MSP is really good, but stingy with the inventory and their attribution status, et cetera. How do we manage the inventory, parts, switches, et cetera, and their installed software? <laughs> Find a new MSP. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that should be something that is delivered on demand. Um, you know, at any point in time, we're able to provide our customers with inventory, patch management, um, you know, and, and all their devices. It should be a 
simple, pretty ask from your, your MSP. So if I can jump in here. I've been a consumer of MSP services in my past life. I am now working for one. What I can, uh, I suggest is you are in the driver's seat. You're the ones paying, you know, that monthly bill to your MSP. If you want something and they're being stingy about it, um, I would demand it. Um, it is your environment. Um, don't allow, you need to manage your, your manage your managed service provider um, and get what you need out of it to run your organization. Okay, I'm not sure if this was part of the um, previous question, but DJ says lately, do they have TMP version 2.0 chips so they all, so they will be upgraded? That's a question. I guess I would need more context there. Um, okay, so DJ, um, if you can retype your question in the Q&A, that would be helpful. Um, the Altoona, I hope I said that right, public library says, I'm attending primarily because we are circulating iPads, Fire HD tablets, and laptops to the public. So multiple brands of devices. I want people to be able to easily use them, but also want to make it easier for on my staff to reset devices without removing essential apps. How do I prevent patrons from downloading apps themselves? Uh, it depends if, if a device manager would allow her to, to do that. It depends on here in Microsoft, Intune would be a, a great avenue to go to. Um, if you're in Google, endpoint management, um, but you need that, you know, control of those devices. Um, you know, there are things to consider. And when you are going to implement a device manager too, is it's great that you have this console, you can deploy it, but all of these devices also have to be added to that device manager. So it might be a pretty arduous task you know, to basically build the device manager and then join these these individual um, things to that and then set the, the procedures. Um, George, anything to add there? It's a challenge, right? Multiple platforms, you really need an underlying system to help you manage that. I think other than that, um, it, uh, it'll become extremely, yeah, for a lot of organizations that have like computer labs and stuff, we we okay. really recommend. Oh, I'm sorry. If there's a product called Deep Freeze that I'm just yeah. by somebody here that could potentially. Okay, so DJ put in the chat um, TMP Trusted Platform Management chips for computers that make it possible to upgrade to Windows 11. TPM is, is a chip that helps security. So it does things like uh, allows you to encrypt your drive um, or allow you to do something like Windows Hello, which is a pin that would help you sign in and do some um, secure signs on. So um, it, that's really hardware based. Um, it, it's there, it's not there. So I'm not quite sure of the question. So okay. If hardware has it or it doesn't have it. Okay. Um, an anonymous attendee said, with mostly everything moved to the cloud, and with us specifically, having shift to Macs, how big of a deal is it is device management? Whether you're in the cloud or not, that device is still in front of you. Right? So you still have a piece of hardware that's there that you're using. So it, it, whether you're in the cloud or not, device management is still in play and is important. What the cloud does is allow you to get the infrastructure out of your office and give you the ability to access that, whatever's in the cloud, from anywhere on the But you're still in the place. And someone asked, um, how do we determine what works for our organization? Great question. You know, that is a, a fantastic organization, whether or not you have the skill set to kind of do the research and come. Um, at the end of this, we're going to share some resources. Um, so if you wanted to talk one-on-one -on -one 
with someone from our team, they'd be happy to, to walk through um, your options. Awesome, and we'll put the chat in there how to reach um, Tech Impact. Um, Parvina, I hope I said that right. What are some products to use to fully move into the cloud? Um, I'm gonna need a little bit more elaboration on that. Um, to move to the cloud depends on where you're moving from and where to, and there is not a particular product that will migrate you to the cloud. Um, so again, I would say reach out to us and have a one-on-one -on -one with a consultant and, and let them kind of see where you're at and where your goals are. And Cynthia says, what do you do if volunteers bring their own devices? Attend session three when we'll talk about bring your own device policies and, and uh, application, um, you know, tightening up your application and access controls. Uh, George, anything you can elaborate on that really quickly? Um, not really quickly. Yeah, not really quickly. It's a bigger, longer discussion. Okay. Clover says, any advice for someone who is just entering the role of an IT manager and having to create systems and procedures that did not exist in the company before? <laughs> I would say good luck. I would say your biggest challenge, and it's not choosing the right tools and getting to where you need, it's going to be getting um, buy-in, both from leadership and staff, and hopefully you have an IT budget to make it happen. Uh, but change management, I think, is is one of the hardest um, hardest things to do as an IT manager. Um, you're trying to set policies and procedures, and you have staff that just won't conform. And being a a new IT manager in in an organization that might be set in his ways, I think it's a challenge. Um, don't know if you'll run into that, but it's it's a common theme. I would just say ensure that you have a roadmap, a plan for what you want to accomplish and make sure that you communicate it with all stakeholders and um, try to communicate the value of it and get buy-in. But if I can add on a little bit. So from a direct resource perspective, if you're looking, I mean, TechSoup has some offerings from policy builders and so does Tech Impact, and so do a lot of these, uh, these organizations that provide these services. You can go out onto the internet and you can look for things like NIST, which is a government organization that would help you develop frameworks around policies and procedures. Um, but as a new IT manager, understand, as Melanie said, understand your organization, what is acceptable, what do they want, what are they driving for? And I would start with the security end of it because that's what's going to give you the biggest nightmare as a new IT manager is, you know, it, it, when a breach happens, how are you going to handle it? And I say when and not if, specifically say when. So, uh, you know, take a look at it, see where um, maybe some resources out on the internet or a place like TechSoup or Tech, Serve, uh, Tech Impact can help you if you have the funding. Um, and and make a make kind of a, a roadmap of where you want to be, where are you here, where you're going to be, align it with your manager or the you know the the directors of the organization, and then go through the change management. Change management is hard. Um, it could be a whole nother webinar on how you move through. through okay. DJ, you had some um some complicated questions, so I'm giving you permission to talk live. So if you're still there, um, you are unmuted if you want to ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, short and sweet, the TPM chip is a security chip that comes with the computer. It became important to us when we looked at replacing new computers because if it doesn't have that new chip, I can't I can't upgrade it to Windows 11. Uh, so it does. It, on the one hand, it's security. On the other hand, it, it affects how how and how often I replace new equipment. Uh, another question that was I saw go by was, uh, how long do you wait for the computer to before you replace it? I know here at our office we look at three to five years minimum. I've got some machines that are 
pushing 10 years now before we look at replacing. More important to us is to consider uh, what's that current computer's performance and then what's the cost of upgrading that machine, if you can, versus replacing it. And I'll pass at that point, unless somebody has a question. Um, I think replacement three to five years, nonprofits pace it to five, six years. Um, we give certain reporting to our organizations, um, give them a report, what's coming up in aging, helping them budget. Um, you know, again, every organization is different. We have some organizations with, you know, organ workstations where majority of them are nine years plus, and we're trying to get them to get new hardware. Um, but I always recommend three to five years, get on a replacement cycle. Don't try to replace all of them at once. Get some rotation in there. Have some backup systems that if there are is an issue with an employee's device, you can kind of pull one out of the pile and give to them interim. Uh, my thing is too, is I always recommend buying the extended warranty on any hardware purchases. Um, and it's really a minimal fee to get some on-site support for those devices, no matter where they are with the extended warranty. Thank you. That's, I agree. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can add to that is that however your, your organization treats financially. So whether you're, you're, you're buying the computers outright, so it's a capital expense, or potentially if you lease them, it would be an operational expense. So you want to handle that, that purchase. Um, and how that handles your books, and that changes what your um, your potential refresh schedule would be. It's, it's your capex expense. Sorry, we're getting into accounting a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we have a depreciation cycle on it. And I think DJ, you bring up a good point. In Windows 11, we should all be looking at the workstation inventory now to see that if it can handle Windows 11. Um, end of life is coming in 2025. So it's something that you definitely want to start looking at and planning for. Um, if you don't mind, Aretha, we're going to get through the last couple slides. And there are so many great questions, but I think a lot of these questions will give our information and they can contact us directly. Awesome. Okay. Very active group, which I love. I'm not a big fan of webinars. I like to see faces. I like to interact with people. So it is really difficult for me to, to sit here and just report out. <laughs> um, so here we go. Where do you go for help? And I think this is, you know, just showing that there's a lot of questions and you you need some guidance. And I know from working with a lot of nonprofits, um, that having a trusted advisor or a trusted consultant is hard to come by. Um, nonprofits, you know, I don't make like to make assumptions, but you definitely hate to spend money. Um, and I think you're always weary because you don't have the knowledge and you're looking for someone to give you that knowledge without overselling you or overcharging you. At, at least that's from a lot of the nonprofit leaders that I engage with. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about managed IT support. Um, I know some of you said you have an MSP. You have someone managing your, your current infrastructure. So I would like you to consider maybe if you don't have managed IT support that you look into the cost of having one. Um, in terms, you know, I used to tell worked my organization 20 years, they would not outsource their IT. I would beg and beg and beg. And I say, if I can do more towards our marketing, towards securing sponsorships, towards getting event attendees in the seats, the amount of time I'm spending on help desk support and on our IT, you know, we could, if we outsourced it, my time is, is well spent elsewhere than handling IT. I wasn't lucky when I did leave, they met, they outsourced IT. Um, so it's, it's a little funny. Um, but again, the benefits of managed IT support are number one, you're tapping into the expertise. Um, and in terms of our staff, we have 110 staff. We have various departments. George sits on the cybersecurity and centralized services. I am basically nonprofit guidance. I um, work with our customers. I work with the account managers that work with our customers. We have a whole consulting team that does a lot of consulting, 
Salesforce support, uh, other things like that. Who am I forgetting, George, and, uh, and all of that. But basically what I'm trying to say is we have broad spectrum expertise in-house. If I take Tech Impact out of this, because there's multiple companies can do it. I'm mm -hmm. very happy working for Tech Impact. I chose Tech Impact. They chose me. But it doesn't need to be Tech Impact. No. No, managed just... Managed IT support, what it does is um, takes that day-to-day -day technology out of your hands, gives it to someone, you know, whether whether Tech Impact or anyone else, and we'll manage that for us. We're the ones worried about whether you're patched or not. We'll provide you reporting. We help you with asset management. Um, also, we don't have vacation issues, right? We, you know, your MSP is managing PTO and, and vacation, where if you're doing it yourself, you go on vacation, something happens, you're getting that phone call, that dreaded phone call. Uh, my executive director can't get into their email. And now, you know, you're getting out of the pool and going back and trying to figure that out. A managed service provider takes all that away from you. Um, we, they bring tools to it that you may not be able to afford on your own. That, that, you know, that's, that's the benefit of a managed service provider. Get that nonsense, right. technology nonsense out of your hands and give it to someone else that lives and breathes it every day. And DJ, you get regular reporting. Um, <laughs> and, you know, know that we're monitoring, you know, any MSP is going to monitor your systems, you know, the help desk just centralized management. And also I think the strategy and the proactive guidance, um, you should be having regular meetings with an account manager or someone at the organization on, you know, what does your, your tech staff look like now? What are some concerns and things you should be planning for the future? What has changed in, you know, the world or environments in general that you need to address and that you have a budget and a plan and a technology roadmap. Um, when it comes to outsourcing, managed IT is, is kind of everything involved. Hold on, okay. There are other IT support options. Um, you know, you can do the full managed IT, so you outsource the entire IT function. Um, you have, you know, hire staff to handle all T IT functions. Um, you know, definitely larger organizations. Um, we tend to see that like 300 plus, you know, has the IT director, full help desk, staff, all of that. Um, you can also outsource certain things. You just want someone to help you with the strategy, but, you know, your employees have the knowledge to, to get the stuff done or, you want to keep the strategy in house, and you just want to outsource particular projects. Um, example of that would be what we discussed: is you want to manage your organization's infrastructure, but you would really like the to you know outsource the project of configuring Intune and getting it set up for device management. That component you can outsource, but still keep the management internal. George, did I miss any other scenario? No, it's, I mean, it's, it really becomes, you know, what, what fits best in your organization. Um, and if you don't know, you can ask, you can get the, you know, that comes back to your strategic plan. You can get, you know, hire someone to do that for you and help put a roadmap together. Um, even large organizations will outsource um, components of it, I feel. You know. So. Where to turn to for help, and then we'll get into the rest of the Q and A or how to contact. Um, like I said, we are long term partner partners of TechSoup. Here is a link to some of the products and services that you know we work with TechSoup that our technicians complete. Um, and there you will find Intune um, and, and various other projects. So cybersecurity consult. Um, if you want to assess where your technology is now, we also do what we call a tech check, and it's a consultant-led assessment um, of where your organization is, and, you know, we kind of help you set that roadmap and identify areas where you um, need to improve. Um, we also offer full managed IT support. 
when you fill out this form, it comes to Tech Impact. And I did this for years sitting on the other end of these phone calls. And really it is the consultation. Where are you? What do you need to improve your environment? Here's what we propose. But then, you know, it gives you an opportunity to then go and see what options, you know, might also fit that and help you come to a conclusion. So at this point, we're going to continue questions because this has been a great active group. Yes, it has. And I want you to know that there'll be hyperlinks. There's some links been put in the chat to contact TAP Network. So there'll be hyperlinks on the slides that we share with you after the webinar. So Nicole says, does all these apply to Chromebooks? This is what we use for our students in our computer labs. So Nicole, Chromebooks are a whole different avenue. Um, and if you're using them for students, there is a resource that is specifically built I, um, for organizations managing them for students. You have a lot of considerations, blocking web access, making sure that, you know, I'm assuming these are children under 18. You definitely need a Chromebook manager. Um, Pretty sure the name is Protivity, but if you Google it, there is somebody that specializes in Chromebook management for organizations. You also want to check out like Google, Google um, Classroom Education, and there'll probably be some links on there. But if you're not managing them from a console or having any device settings, you you know, we should definitely look at that right away. Awesome. Someone wanted to know, we've been looking into MS iTunes. Do we get a discount if we are less than 300 employees or is there a revenue limitation as well? Do you know? I assume they're asking for licensing in terms, you know, that is going to be, you have options in terms of under 300 is a very vague number. Um, it would be what licensing you're going to get for under 300, when you look at Microsoft licensing, you can go in the business line, the, um, you know, you can buy a standalone license, which is an EMS E3. If you're over 300, you really should be using the enterprise versions of licensing. Hopefully that was a licensing question. Mm, not sure, but Josh has a licensing question. He said, we are Microsoft 365 E3 shop. I like to get our PCs upgraded to Windows 11. Has anyone done this before? The question my staff and I can't find an answer to is where the license, where are the license for them? And is there a site license? Where can we go to find the answer? Uh, TechSoup. Um, E3 doesn't have to do anything with the Windows 11 upgrade. Um, you should be able to uh, find that Windows 11 update on TechSoup products. Awesome sauce. And I'm sure um, Justin will put that link in the chat and um, we'll share that with you or Justin's contact information. And someone says, how do we track the age of each device? A really good device manager will give you the age of all your devices. Okay. Roy says, uh, we have managed IT support for $1,800 a year. Is that an average price for a small nonprofit? It all depends. Small, you know, like it depends on how, what type of support you're getting. How, you know, is it based on users? Is it based on, you know, number of workstations? And I will say, saying it's a good price, it might be cheap, but is it the best in terms of the support they provide? It, it, it really is an apples to apples price comparison and shopping around. Okay. Trevor wanted to know, is anyone currently using free device manager software? And if so, what is it called? There were a couple in the chat. Um, I think someone said Spiceworks was free for basic. And then I've seen a couple others come through. Awesome. So if you want Again, to don't, I don't that recommend I like I I haven't done the homework and haven't looked at them. 
Okay. Uh, Sarah wants to know, does your organization work nationwide and where are you located? We have, oh my gosh, George, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have, we're located in Philly, a couple of Delaware offices. We have a Vegas office. Um, and we are national. We actually, I like to say, like we have a couple actual clients in Canada as well. So I would say we're international. Organizations um, <laughs> in every fifty states. Um, yeah. Um, um, and I see UK. We have a client that uh, <laughs> we share with TechSoup um, that is international. Mm -hmm. But we what. We don't really go after the international market. We stay, we're, we're, we're better at the domestic uh, the US. Awesome. Um, someone wanted to know, how do we know that our organization is secure through the cloud using your IT group? Using oh. our IT <laughs> That's um, a whole different set of, of questions in terms of cloud security. And I've seen some of this come into the chat. So... George, you want to take this one? Um, yeah, so I can't give you a, an answer. What we would do is we would look at um, your tenant. We look at what policies are out there, what restrictions, what kind of data you have, um, you know, what your organization, who you serve, um, and then talk to you about how to put the right protections around it. Um, you could, you know, if you're a small nonprofit, you can you can go on um, on Microsoft and they'll have certain guidelines you should do from a basic perspective. But um, how I would secure your tenant versus how I'd secure someone else's tenant is different because um, it depends on what what organization, what you're serving, what your mission is, what type of data you have. Are you HIPAA based? Are you you have PII? You have PCI? It, it, it's it's really hard. It, it all changes depending on what you're, you know, what the community you are you serve, you're serving. Yeah, and I think there's always this. I'd like to have my server. I don't want my data out there as a cloud secure. It's all in how you maintain it and mitigate risk. Um, you know, no one's ever going to say it's a hundred percent secure, but there are industry best standards that we will do to secure the infrastructures and the systems. Um, I used to say, do you think our system's more secure with me in the back room managing our server and our network or in the cloud where Microsoft engineers are working on it day in and day out? Um, again, that's not a good analogy, but it's how I um, was able to get my organization to move to the cloud, which showed you the confidence level they had in me. <laughs> um, so Average cost. <laughs> the, the biggest security hole in any organization is the person sitting on the keyboard or mouse. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, so that's the biggest security hole. Um, anyone you ask in, this, in, in, in the industry will tell you that. Um, Microsoft definitely helps or, or Google helps on the underlying infrastructure to ensure you're not making mistakes or they don't make the mistakes that we may as a human um, on a local scale. They have automation. Okay, last two questions. And um, Josh, I think you asked a question earlier uh, and I asked Justin to put his email contact in there. You want to know about the Microsoft iTunes so you guys can communicate about that. But his last question from Josh was for Windows endpoint management for Microsoft 365 iTunes, how much of a difference does it make between the pro and the enterprise? The licensing, the pro and the enterprise licenses are the same, Josh. You have access to it. Um, so there's, there's really no different versions of Intune. It, it's just the licensing cost. Okay, and final question. Um, what's the current average cost of managed IT? Can you give a, a range? Oh, it's all over. It's depending on what the provider is doing for you. I would say call, talk to one of our people, get a quote of what managed IT support looks like from Tech Impact, um, and then go out and get a couple other proposals and, and compare apples to apples and, and just see where the pricing is. 
Okay, well, I want to just remind everybody this is being recorded. You're going to get the video replay and the slides and every hyperlinks in the slides and the email. I want to say thank you to George and Melanie and Justin in the background. Melanie, did you want to have any closing remarks? No, I would say good luck to you all. I've been in your shoes um, and I wish you well. And uh, thanks for joining today. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.